Hello and welcome to the second session of our F1 Aerodynamics Workshop here at SimScale. Yes, I'm very happy to welcome so much attendees again today. And before we actually start to dive into the uh, subject of this second uh, session, I would just like to make sure that the audio is working for most of you. Uh, so please, in the case you can hear me loud and clear, click the raise your, raise your hand button. I see a lo lot of hands, great. Okay, guys, perfect. In the case uh, audio should not, not work during the session or you should get some technical problems, you can also use our dial-free toll-in service numbers, which you can see here for several countries. You just have to dial this number, which is, as I mentioned, for free, and enter this access code to join the audio stream of the session. Great, yes, today our second session is about rear wing design or rear wing aerodynamics in general. So today I will again give a crisp introduction to the workshop series um, just because we have some new uh, some participants who are uh, new to this, this workshop series. Um, then my colleague Akram will give you again some insights into the fundamentals of Formula 1 aerodynamics. We will then have a live demonstration and set up together an uh, uh, aerodynamic simulation of F1 rear wing. We will take a look at the results and since there was some request, also talk about post-processing a little bit more. And then I will present your homework assignment to you and we will have sure, for sure time for questions and answers again. Great, okay, then let's start. My name is Milad and I will, uh, together with Aquam, I will be uh, your presenter for this and the next session of the F1 workshop series. And the idea of this workshop is to, to give everybody who's interested in Formula 1 or automotive aerodynamics a hands-on introduction into the world of aerodynamics and CFD simulation. And we really want to, to, to um, help everybody who is attending this workshop series to be able later on to create simulation of his own designs. Therefore, we cannot really uh, deliver a, a full-fledged uh, training about simulation theory or, or about, for example, more practical application of simulation technology. So if you're not, if you're interested in more than only F1 aerodynamics, you should take a look at our documentation of our other workshop series we are offering. And if you want to use simulation for your commercial projects, we can recommend the professional training. And the best thing is that you guys can qualify for one of these free professional trainings with a value of 500 euro. Yes, and in addition, we would really uh, appreciate if, if there is something about the SimScale you would like to, to be improved, just let us know. We are love to get uh, as much feedback as, as we can, and we will try to, to um, yes, imp improve everything you guys think we should imp uh, could be improved. Okay, finally, this is the second out of three sessions, so you will have every week, uh, we will have a one hour live webinar session, which will be also recorded, so you can take a look at the recording later on. We will also have optional homework assignments for every session, so you have some days left for the last week's uh, homework assignment and in the next days we will also pr uh, uh, upload the step-by-step -step instructions for the next homework assignment so this makes it very easy to follow every session and qualify for the free professional training. Okay, right, then thank you very much for your time and now I'm very happy to, to have Akram here uh, from our partner company Friendship Systems who is very passionate about F1 aerodynamics and will today give you introduction into F1 aerodynamics. So, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, welcome for, to joining us for this webinar series between SimScale and Friendship Systems, two German companies. So, let's start about me. So, my name is Akram, I'm CAE Application Engineer Intern at Friendship Systems AG in Potsdam, Germany, with aeronautical engineering academic background and childhood passion and enthusiasm about Formula One aerodynamics and more sport in general. So, in this uh, presentation of today, we will try to cover all the, the aerodynamics of the car and how the air is channeled around the car from the front to the back, step by step. And let's start from the front and especially we will talk about the front wing. The front wing is the first part that that cuts through the air, so it's a really important part, not only because it's the 
the part that generates the most of downforce in the front, but also because it's the first part that hits the air. So all the flow all, all along the car can be controlled using this part. So let's talk more about the details of this um, part and the development here. So generally this part is regulated like we have seen the last time with the FAA regulation. And generally here in the middle, this middle section is, um, so all the F1 cars have the same region here. And all the design and the development is done here from the sides in this region and this region here. So we can see here with, with this picture that they are using many elements here to make sure that they can generate maximum downforce as possible without stalling the wing. And if we talk more about this different part, so here we have the inner plate. The role of the inner plate is to um, sell the wing from the sides to make sure that all the pressure generated from the top of the wing will not escape from the sides. And of course, this will generate to generate more downforce. If we go here to this part here, this is what we call it uh, the, the cascade element. This cascade element is, so we have this turning vane here and we have this flap. So the rule is to control or to channel the air to the outside of the tire but also to the upside. So the flow coming from the front will be channeled from the outside and on the top of the, wing, uh, of the tire to make sure that the flow is smoothed in this region. Also we have this turning vane called the our vein is used is used also to turn the air to the outside, but also to help the the cascade element to work more better. And the last time we have talked about too much about this concept of the Y250, and I will talk about this today in many uh, occasions because it's a really important concept. And uh, this. This vortex is created here in this point of transition between the mid, uh, mid wing and the, the outer wing. In this point, well, they call it the Y250 because it's in the Y direction, 250 millimeters from the center of the car. So this, for this reason, is called the Y250. And this vortex, strong vortex, is generated because we have this discontinuity in the wing and this large discontinuity create like strong vortex that will be created here and will travel um, just here under the, the front suspension system and will be guided with this turning vane here. So the, the idea is this vortex will travel along this way under the suspension system and will be conducted with this um, uh, turning vane and the idea is to push the wick coming from the front tires because this front tire will generate wick and this wick will go to the, the side port area and we will discover this in the few slides. Uh, also another um, thing that I want to talk about here from this picture is that these two elements here in the front wing are adjusted so the uh, the mechanisms during the pit line, they, pit stop, they can change the angle of these two flaps here to, to make sure that you have the right balance. So if we take another look from the lower side of the wing, so we can see other interesting things here. So if we talk, if we talk in terms of vortices, so we have talked about the Y250 that is generated in the, the, sand, the, the inner region of the front wing, but also we have another interest in vortices that created from the outside. Maybe, maybe if I will back here to explain more, so uh, we have a vortex that will be created here from the upper edge of the end plate, and this because due to the difference of pressure between this region and this region. And also we have this uh, channel here or this tube here, um, or they call it like, uh, this uh, I, uh, the duct, this duct here is used because the flow here in this region is with high pressure compared to the flow underneath the, the front wing. So the, the air will try to escape to this region. So they use this one to create a vortex here to make sure that the flow with high pressure will not affect this region of the, the front wing to make sure that the front wing will work efficiently. So let's back to this picture and to talk a little bit about these things here like you can see. So also like I told you that this channel here is used to create a vortex to make sure that this uh, turbulent, uh, this 
air with high pressure will not escape to this region. Also, they use this two first uh, fences here to create another vortices here. So these two small uh, fences here are create are used to create a vortices to make sure that this large vortex that come from the outside to the inside of the the, the front wing will be reduced in small vortices. Then we have like these two fences here. These two fences here are used to generate strong vortex. So, so this vortex will travel um, inside, beside the front tire, and the idea is to help the Y250 vortex to create more outwash to push the turbulent air coming from the front tires and will not affect the, the, uh, the side pod and the leading edge of the floor. Also, we can see here in this front wing this um, tunnel here. This tunnel is used to create vortices, and this vortices is created especially here in this region, in this sharp edge. So the flow will try to come from here, with, from the high pressure region to the low pressure region, and when it reaches this place here, will create a vortex, one here, one here, and in every age, age there is a vortex created and these vortices are used to control the flow to the outside of the tire to make sure that you will reduce the drag created by the front tires. And when we are talking about the, the front tires, let's talk a little bit about the, the duct of the, the brake cooling because here, this is a new design concept of the brake cooling system, but with the old uh, designs, there is like a duct here, but this duct will affect the air, so will create more disturbance for the air, so for this reason, they have integrated this uh, cooling system here between this uh, panel here and the tire, like you can see here where there is this pipe is to cool. The, the brake system, so here we can see the brake system, how it looks like, so the mechanism and the disc, and the idea is to take, in, because with high speed when the driver is braking, this disc is really hot, and we try always to make, to cool it, to reduce its temperature, and for this reason, this system is used to to take sound from the air from here and um, conduct it through this brake system and we will have like flow coming from the outside. And also we can see here this uh, yellow uh, part here, so it's just to show you how um, the design looks like. So this vein here is to create a vortex and also this vortex is used to push the turbulent flow coming from the front tire outboard to um, clean the flow in the side pod and also the leading edge of the floor. So all these vortices are used to uh, help the aerodynamic and to make the car more efficient. Another, another interesting point where I want to talk about is the, the suspension system. So concerning the suspension system, um, generally if you see here the suspension system, the profile are designed in a way not, not to generate downforce, but at some point it's neutral uh, airfoils, but at some point also they use this airfoils in a way to generate a little bit of um, lift force, and the idea is because the flow coming here from the front wing is really uh, controlled to the up because this front wing will create strong upwash here. So the air will go up and if you, you keep it like this, you will have a lick of air. So we will not have too much air to inject it under the car to create downforce. So this, this suspension system is used to like uh, conduct this air coming from here to the up and using this suspension system you will direct it to the lower side here to inject it to the side pod and also the leading edge of the floor. And also this, they, they work too much here in this region to make it like you can see here this new design with only one element. So if we uh, talk about the elements, so here we have the lower wishbone, here the upper wishbone, here we have the push rod, and this um, one here is what we call the steering, uh, the steering uh, system. So this one here. All right, so we have talked too much about the front of uh, the front tires wick, and in this picture we can see why this they put a lot of emphasis on this part because the flow behind the tire is really turbulent and 
in fact the tire is not the right aerodynamic shape so for this reason you can see the flow behind the tire is really turbulent and it's with low kinetic energy so if we see in this picture the red and the orange colors represent the high kinetic energy flow on the stream and uh, the red and the blue one represent the low kinetic energy flow and if uh, if we can imagine just like this turbulent flow will go directly to the sideboard and the leading edge of the floor, we can see how much this will affect, affect the efficiency of these two parts. Let's go more further in our path. So let's talk more about this uh, leading edge of the floor or what we call it the T-tray. So the T-tray is really close part to the, lead, uh, to the floor and this part will work in a ground effect. So will really help the floor and the diffuser to accelerate the air maximum as possible. And also the role of this part is to split the air to the side pod. So we'll channel the air to the side pod from the sides as well from the lower side to the floor. And also we will see later in some uh, CFD pictures how these edges here will create vortices to control the flow underneath the car also to create a more uh, suction effect under the floor. If we go, so we was just here in the T-tray in the leading edge of the floor. Now let's go to the barge board. So this element here um, highlighted here with the yellow color is called the barge board. And this, this um, element is use it to scavenge the air coming from the front wing and also from the suspension system and try to like smooth this air to the side pod because the side pod is this area here this panel um, I will talk about this in the few slides so we we need to get like maximum as possible clean air in this region so for this reason you use, you use this um, panel here to straight and to clean and to smooth the air come into this area here like I told you to, to take it to the rear of the car. Also we have here this element uh, maybe in the next, yeah, so here we have this turning vane here. It's really important also to, to smooth and to control the flow coming from the tire because like we have seen in this animation of CFD, the flow behind the tire is really turbulent and we use this element here to like smooth the air the, the turbulent air coming from the front tire and to um, channel to this side here. Also, if we see in more details here, if you focus on this element, these elements are what we call vortex generators. And the idea from using these vortex generators is, um, as you can see here, the side pod. So the side pod, it's like the, the housing of for the engine and the gearbox and the design of this a side pod is really critic because this curvature here will create a suction effect and will create a lift force. So the idea in designing the side pod is always to keep it like um, channeling the air inside here because this duct here is to cool the, the engine. So try to design the side pod in a way to uh, control the air from the inside but also to reduce the lift force created by this part and when I have talked about these vortex generators because like you can see here this curvature is a little bit aggressive so uh, the flow at some point can detached at some uh, points because the flow will lose some energy in the boundary layer and will not be able to stay attached to this surface so for this reason they use these vortex generators just here in front of this uh, duct here and the idea from using vortex generators is to like uh, taking some particles or some flow uh, elements with high kinetic energy from the upstream from the flow stream and uh, scavenge it and take it to the boundary layer to give more kinetic energy to the boundary layer to make sure that this boundary layer will still at, stay attached along this side pod area here so also we can talk about this uh, duct here. This, this duct is for the intake of the engine uh, to make sure that the engine will work in the right conditions. You need to make sure that your design is um, really uh, designed in a way to uh, deliver the right quantity of the air to the engine. So also this 
this duct here is related to the helmet of the driver. So even the helmet of the driver have some fences and some elements to control the flow going to this region here. Here we can see also the camera where when you watch the TV and you see this uh, inboard uh, shot. So we are watching from this element here. Okay, so we have talked about the side pod. Now let's go more further and we will talk about this region here. So one of the most interesting thing is this fin here. So before talking about this fin, so I will just let you know that in this region here we try to make a balance between how much the flow is accelerated in the same time, how much pressure you can put on this uh, top side of the floor because you need to create some um, pressure here to on this floor to increase the downforce but in the same time you want to like uh, accelerate your flow to inject it in, uh, underneath the, the rear wing to give more downforce so it's up to you to design your car in a way to create down create pressure on the top side of the floor but in the same time try to make it more uh, moving air to the the rear wing okay so like I mentioned, this fin here is used in a way to create a vortex. So, but what's the reason for creating a vortex here? Imagine just like you have a stagnation pressure here on top in front of the rear tire, and this region will be really in high pressure. So, what the flow will try it will try to go to the other sides to the the region where the flow is uh, with low pressure, and in this region. In this point here, there is a vortex that will create it here in this point. And the purpose from using this vortex is to inject it between the rear tire and the, the floor. And we will talk about this more in the few next slides. And this vortex is used to sell the rear, the rear diffuser from the sides because there is a turbulent flow coming from the rear tires and what we call the tire squared. And this tire squared is with the really kinetic energy flow. So we don't need this flow to go to the, the floor because if this flow will go to the floor will really affect the performance of the floor and you will lose a lot of downforce. Okay, so here it's the rear tire from the rear side, and we can see this many uh, elements here. These elements are used to create downforce. This downforce is used directly by the rear tire, so applied directly to the rear tire here to push the tire to the ground, especially this helps too much in the curves to, to take the curve with high speed. But also the role of these elements is to um, make sure that you will take maximum of air from these sides um, up uh, so up uh, stream so to create up wash here and to make sure that you will not get too much air in this region uh, between the rear tire and the floor to make this region clean here and to control the flow in this region and like I told you uh, this thing just was here in the front is used to create this vortex that will sell the diffuser in this region between the rear tire and the diffuser. Also, we can see here the this pipe here, it's the, the exhaust system, so with the old regulation, it was mounted just here from the sides and the team was using this um, uh, exhaust air to inject it between the tire and the rear diffuser to sell this region, but now they have no um, they don't have this option, so the, the, um, the pipe of the exhaust is here in the middle, so they can't use it to sell the sides of uh, the, the diffuser. Let's go back and let's talk uh, more about the rear wing, because today's presentation is more about the rear wing, so we will try to cover more things about the rear wing. So generally the rear wing of the modern Formula 1 car is built by two elements. So what we call the main wing here, this large element, and we have the flap. It's by regulation to have two elements. And also to have two elements, this allows you to like increase your camber uh, to get more downforce because like we have seen in the previous presentation, it's not possible to get like one element with high camber because at some point you will um, have a solid wing. So for this reason, we have two elements. Let's talk more in details about this uh, part in the car. So here, if you see this 
weird shape here. This is what we call it the DRS or drag reduction system actuator. So this this is what uh, actuates the DRS. So it's a drag reduction system actuator. The idea behind the DRS is that this flap here, the second element, uh, the angle of this element is adjusted. So and uh, so when it is closed, you, the rear wing will generate maximum downforce. But when it is opened, so this will reduce the downforce. But the interesting thing that this will increase the, the, the speed of the car because you will reduce the drag of the created by the rear wing. And by in, in the regulation in the race, so how this system is used during the race, if you if the driver is behind the the, the the car in front by one second and in specific uh, part of the track, for example, in the street line, this uh, the driver can activate this system to open this flap so they will have more speed and approximately he can gain like um, up to 15 to 20 kilometer per hour in when he opened this element, the, the second element. So this is what we call it the DIS actuator. Uh, let's talk more about these fins here, so these slots in the end plate. So the end plate, the same like the front wing, is to uh, keep the air on top of the wing and this flow will not escape from the sides, but also in the rear wing is more used for structural um, uh, purpose, so to make sure that your wing is, um, the assembly of the wing is really rigid to be assembled to the car. So these fins is here, or these slots, are used um, in a way to, because here on top of the rear wing you have really high pressure, and if we close, imagine like we have closed elements here, these elements are closed, so we have just like one panel uh, end plate of the rear wing, so the, the air will try to escape from the top here to the out. Uh, here because here we have atmospheric pressure approximately so we have large delta P and the flow will try to escape. So when this happens, a strong, really big vortex will create in this region. And the vortex will create what we call it the induced drag. So this induced drag is really not what we want in aerodynamics. So to reduce this effect, what they do, they have opened these uh, slots here in the end plate and the idea is to reduce l some of the this pressure so we have high pressure but when you open the flow will try to escape through these uh, slots in a way like um, with without creating too much vortices but the idea is if you will reduce this pressure from the top here and you will have more pressure here so the delta P is not too much so we will not have really strong vortex so we will reduce this vortex and in consequence you will reduce the the induced drag in a way so this is the idea behind using these slots here. Also let's see here in the middle we have this fin, the black one here is what we call it the uh, the gap separator and this gap separator is used because at high speed this rear wing can generate too much downforce and um, with this high loading this this element here can be flexed and if it's flexed the aerodynamic characteristic of the wing will not be uh, the one that we want in in tests so for this reason they use this gap separator to make sure that this gap will stay the same uh, everywhere and if we see this cut here from the top this cut is re is the same in the same position of this gap separators so the idea behind this cut is just here in this gap separator there is a boundary layer that we create here and also on the top and the lower side of this flap. So these two boundary layers will interact between each other and will create separation at some point here in the flow. So for this reason they have decided to reduce the cord length of the flap to, to make sure that you will not uh, have rotation flow, detached flow here in the re in the back. So the idea from this one uh, is uh, from this cat is to reduce the cord length of the the flap of the rear wing. If we look more 
for, uh, to the end plate of the rear wing so we can see a lot of stuff here like this fans here also this uh, slots or this um, yeah, these slots or fans here. So the idea from these fans is because like we have seen in this animation of the, the, the flow behind the tire is really turbulent and what we are trying to do to take this uh, quantity from this turbulent flow and to um, inject it behind, uh, between these elements to accelerate the flow and to give the flow more kinetic energy to reduce the effect of of the, the dry created by the tires, but also these fins will help to create an outwash to push the air, to push the turbulent air or the wake of the tires from the sides to make sure that this flow, low turbulent, low kinetic energy turbulent flow will not go to the, the back or the, yeah, to the back of the car. Also these elements here are used to create um, uh, outwash uh, sorry, upwash to push the air to make sure that to help the rear wing to work better. And also we can see these slots here in the leading edge of the, the end plate. So generally these elements are used to, like I told you, there is a turbulent flow created from the walls of the tire, especially here from the lower side. So this flow will be uh, uh, controlled in a way to uh, flow flow through these ducts and will give it more energy to reduce this turbulent flow and the effect of this turbulent flow here. All right, let's talk now about really interesting thing in the Formula One uh, aerodynamics. It's what we call it the diffuser. So the idea behind the diffuser, it's the diffuser generally will work with the floor and it's with the same principle as the venturi tube so uh, if I will explain this in few words so imagine just like you have high velocity air and uh, between the floor and the the ground of the ground of the race track and the floor of the car so this very very high velocity flow will reach the diffuser and when, when it reaches the diffuser will have more uh, size or more volume to fit so will this flow will try to fill this uh, size and to do this need to accelerate the flow more in the floor to fill this uh, high chamber or this uh, region so for this reason this diffuser will help the, the floor to um, accelerate the air more and during the floor to create more suction all right so let's see uh, so we have seen we have seen just some uh, real pictures. Now let's see some uh, CFD pictures, and we will see more pressure distribution and vortices, and we will understand more things in these few slides. So here we can see the front wing and the nose that the the pressure is really high from the top side, and this to generate downforce, but also for the nose, this will generate a little bit drag. So they try always to find the right design for the nose to reduce the drag but also the problem for the nose you can't design any design because you can make it like um, the, you can make your nose thin as possible but you need to take in consideration the crash tests because they use this uh, nose in crash tests and you need to make it like strength maximum as possible but also you need to take in consideration the aerodynamic um, characteristics of this wing and this uh, this sorry of this nose and this nose of course will affect the region under the the chassis here so we need to make your sure that your design is uh, designed in the right way so if we see here like I told you that the suspension system will create some lift because you can see that there is a section from the top side of the the wishbones so this will create some lift force but of course like I have explained the idea from the suspension system is to uh, redirect this flow coming from here because the flow will try to go upside up upstream then will conduct it to go down again to this region here so we can see that from the top of the tire there is a suction effect due to the shape of the tire and this 
will create lift. So for this reason, tires generate some lift. So it's not the tires are not the right aerodynamic shape because they have they generate too much drag and some lift lift force. Uh, here we can see the stagnation pressure in the helmet of the driver and also here in this uh, glass, the front glass of the cockpit. Also we can see this suction effect in the side pod, so this flow here we try to make to accelerate the flow maximum as possible here in this region to create like you can see this blue dot here, uh, this blue uh, spot here and this spot will create suction because we'll like uh, suck the air of the car to the, the low to down uh, to the down all right so let's see some other slides from the top and the bottom of the car so uh, here we can see the regions that generate maximum downforce is the front wing because like you can see here you can see the difference of pressure so from the top side we have high pressure and from the low side we have suction effect so we have a uh, large delta p and also, like we have seen in the top side of the, the tires, there is a suction effect, but from the lower side, we have stagnation pressure here. So this difference of pressure will push the tires to the up, so we'll generate lift. Also, the leading edge here of the floor is really important that it contributes to generating too much uh, downforce. And of course, like we have talked it before about the, the diffuser, and we can see here the suction effect in the diffuser. And in this picture here, we can see the, the ground effect, or if we plot our pressure distribution on the ground, we can see which region is really affected, and we can verify this, that the front wing, the leading edge of the floor and also the leading edge of the tea tray and the diffuser generate maximum downforce or ground effect because this picture here, the dark regions represent high pressure and the light region represent the low pressure regions. And in this picture we can see the parts that generate the contribution of uh, parts in drag and lift or downforce so we can see that the front wing generates um, approximately too much approximately 50 percent or no it's it's 30 percent of the total downforce of the car of the car the tires like I told you generate some lift force so it's in the negative so it's lift force so the chassis and the bodywork like we have talked here this this is the side pod will generate lift force, so we can see that generates approximately 10% of the lift. It's not downforce, but we are, we are talking about lift. The floor generates too much downforce due to the ground effect. So, so here it's the diffuser and the floor because these two parts work uh, together to get the right uh, performance. The rear, the rear uh, tire and suspension assembly will generate some downforce and we can see that the rear wing contribute um, greatly to generate downforce, the whole downforce of the car. But generally we don't look only for downforce but we look to the efficiency and if we talk about the efficiency we can see that the most efficient part is the floor and the diffuser because generate too much downforce with really low drag. So we have to take this in consideration, but if we t look, for example, in the rear wing, the rear wing is not really efficient part because generate too much downforce, but in the same time generate too much drag. All right, so we have talked about the different parts of the car, and also we have tried to explain some uh, aerodynamic concepts and also some some plot to see the pressure distribution and the force distribution, but in Formula 1 it's really important to take care about vortices. Due to this discontinuity in the shape of the car and you have a lot of sharp edges, make sure that you have a large set of vortices all over your car and in this next few slides we'll try to cover this different uh, concepts of the vortices. So maybe here uh, just to, to show you, uh, this is what we call the Y250. So if you follow my mouse here, so just here you can see the Y250 vortex. 
and here we will we see the rear wing vortex this vortex is created from these slots in the end plate like I have explained before and I will show you here more details and we will try to understand uh, the major vortices and the major vortex cores uh, over the car so generally if we look to this picture here so we have different forces created in the discontinuity due to the discontinuity of the, the the shape of the car and let's start to talk about uh, these vortices from the front to the back so here we have this vortex created in the interplate of the front wing so this one and always, like I said, the vortices are created from the difference of pressure and also the discontinuity in the shape. So this vortex can be used in a way because, like I have explained, the flow will go here through this duct and will try to cool the brake system and will, the flow will go from this way. And this flow is really turbulent and low kinetic energy flow. So what we are what we try to do here with this vortex is to give more uh, energy to this flow to reduce the effect of this low kinetic energy flow here so this vortex here if i will back here you can see that from this uh outlet here the flow is really turbulent so we try to use this vortex to reduce the effect of this turbulent flow um from here from the outlet of the brake system uh cooling also, we can see the Y250 vortex, this really strong vortex from here. Uh, maybe in this design it's not really a strong, but in real Formula 1 car is really strong and is more uh, conducted to the outboard here. So it will go in this way, but more outboard. So maybe like this and the idea is the turbulent flow behind the rear tire but the front tire sorry is really turbulent and we don't need it in this region here the side pod and the leading edge of the floor so for this reason we use this vortex to push the air outboard more also uh, we can see the rear wing forces like we have seen in this uh, animation before and here if you see in more details you can see this vortex created just in this fin that I have explained that this vortex just here is uh, conducted between the rear tire and the diffuser the idea is to seal the diffuser from the sides to make sure that the turbulent air, uh, air from the rear tires will not go to the diffuser region all right so maybe from the lower side of the car also we can see approximately the same vortices but we what we can see here this vortex created from the t tray uh, element and also in the leading edge here we can see this strong vortices and these vortices because the vortex is low uh, the pressure core and can be used underneath the car to create more suction to help the 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 floor to create more suction and more downforce all right so uh, that's all what we have for today I hope this presentation was helpful for you so here is just a picture of post-processing all right so uh, maybe I you can find some nice article in this link where I have taken this picture of the forces distribution on the car. So that's all for today. Many thanks for, uh, for your time and hope to see you again the, the next session. Akram, thank you very much for, for your, your presentation. I really enjoyed it and I think uh, our participants also enjoyed it too because we got a lot of questions regarding your presentation okay. and guys don't worry we will answer some questions all uh, later on during our Q&A um, first of all um, yes I would like right now to start with a live demonstration I think especially at the end Akram told us a lot of very interesting insights about the rear wing and today we will create a aerodynamic simulation of a F1 rear wing and um, yes, first of all, maybe let's again talk about the, the rough process. So the idea you're using CFD, CFD is for computational fluid dynamics. And so the idea of CFD is to, to simulate the be behavior of, of air flowing through something or around something. 
And in this case, we want to simulate the, the reaction of the airflow when streaming around this rear wing. And first of all, to do a fluid flow simulation, we need a three-dimensional model of the part, so a CAD model. And uh, there are a lot of, of nice free, uh, free CAD models of F1 car, for example, Nick Perrin's F1 project, where we also took, which we also used uh, for this workshop series. And when you have this three-dimensional design, first of all, for a simulation, you have to create what we call a mesh. You can see this mesh on the second image here. And the idea of how to understand why we need a mesh, you should imagine that in the end, a computer can only, only store a finite number of, of information. And therefore, if you want to simulate the air around something, you have to specify exactly locally where you want to have the code, where do you want exactly the computer to calculate the, the mean physical quantities like velocity and pressure. And so the accuracy, the local accuracy of a simulation result is according to the density of this mesh. And therefore, we are first of create this mesh to tell the, the computer where to where we need which accuracy and finally the step is to set up the simulation and analyze the results which we call post processing okay and this is uh, i know we talked about it last week but it's very important and there were some questions so i would like to repeat it let's talk about this process of meshing just imagine this is our body we want to simulate it's a let's say a simplified car shape and in the end, first of all, what we need is the fluid flow domain because we have to, to, to give boundaries for the computer which areas around our object we're interested in the flow. And first of all, for this, we create a kind of, let's say, virtual wind tunnel. And so we don't want to simulate this geometry of the car, but we want to simulate the gray geometry, the gray face, which is the, the domain of the air around the car. Then first of all, we create a background mesh which is the coarsest mesh size we can use later on. And then based on all settings, some scale will refine the area uh, around the, the physical object, delete the inner part of the mesh, refine the alter vo volume, and snap it. By the way, the reason why we're using this, this region refinement is that we ex uh, expect high changes in velocity here around the object, and therefore we'll have a finer mesh where we get a better accuracy of the simulation. And this is very important. So the way you design your mesh can have a big influence on the quality of your simulation results. And finally, we can also add layers which are a special kind of elements of cells for refined areas in the near of walls. Okay, then let's start. And first of all, we will uh, open a project containing this geometry of the rear wing. I've prepared something for sure, so let's open the project. Okay, then let's start. Here you see a project, which I will later also provide you with. And this project includes the rear wing, model of the rear wing. And in this case, we have even different sub-assemblies like, let's start like this, like for example, the end plates, this separators for the boundary layer, Akram told about, talked about, or even the flap and the main plane. And first of all, and this is very, the, the process right now is very similar to the one I showed you last week. First of all, we have to create a new mesh. And we'll select the rear wing as the base because we want to smash this geometry. And when it's loaded, you have again the geometry of your rear wing. You can check here, for example, the bounding box length and the, the length in different directions to make sure the scaling is work correctly. And I mean, this values make absolutely sense. And then we'll add the mesh operation. In our case, we'll use Snappy X mesh, which is the best choice for complex geometries and CFD simulations. Save it, and then this tree get added. And in this tree, we're in the end defining the whole mesh, and we can just go through this tree and be guided by it. First of all, let's start to define this uh, fluid flow domain. And we can define it by giving minimum and maximum coordinates. So we give two opposite points of this, this box to define its size.
And now this is our box and it makes sense. Important here is to, to keep this uh, value zero for minimal position of Z because then we have the correct ground distance between the wing and the floor. Nice. Next we have to define the base mesh, base mesh size. As you can remember, we have to define the size of this mesh. And this is defined implicitly by giving here the number of cells in each direction. And since we want to have a base mesh size of a half meter, 40, 10, 10, because we have 20 meters in x direction. <laughs> Sorry, we have 20 meters in x directions and 5 meters in y and z direction, so this will result in half a meter base mesh size. Okay, then let's go on and save. And next we can start to define the material point. As you know, at some point in a part of the mesh is deleted and therefore you define a material point which is should be lying in the in the area which you want to keep. So for us it means we should keep this point inside of the domain but outside of the wing. And let's try for example minus three, minus two, one. Here is the point, I hope you can see it here. If we now also show the domain, it's inside the domain, outside the geometry, perfect. And now we can start to add refinements. First of all, we will add a refinement to the surface. So let's select surface refinement. Then we will select all bodies, add them, and we want to have a level uh, between 7 and 8. By, uh, as you can remember, an increase of level by 1 means that you split the cells. So the cells, the base mesh size is split between 7 and 8 times. Then we will also add an edge refinement to cover the sharp edges better. For this, the type feature refinement. This is fine and we will define from a distance from 1 millimeter from the surface have a level of 9. Then we will also add layers. So we'll add layers to all surfaces. And we will also add layers on the floor. On Emox layer edition, this is Zetman 3 are enough three layers. Okay, and since we also want to add a region refinement, we have to create a additional box which we can use later on to assign a region refinement. And we will use this coordinates here. Oh, it's just one thing wrong. And this region will refine later on. Now we are ready to start the meshing process, clicking on the Start Meshing button. And since this can take between 10 uh, and 20 minutes, depending on the number of processes we use, for example in this case we only use four processors, which is two less maybe for the big mesh, I have prepared for sure already a mesh with the same settings. And I will recommend you to use more processors, at least 16 or 32. Okay, and this mesh was created with exactly the same settings. And here we can see our result. So first of all, maybe what is very nice, we have the layer here on the for the layer refinement, and we have the same kind of refinement on the surface of our wing, which is very nice. So if we turn out the bounding box walls, then we can really zoom in 
see the mesh, how it was refined. If we turn on only the surface representation on, we can see how good even the sharp edges were captured by the mesher. And finally, let's take a look inside the mesh using a mesh clip. So it can take up to some seconds, but let's just wait. Maybe in the meantime, we can do a quick wrap up. So I showed you, first of all, how to define the base setup for Snap PX Mesh. So you have to create the base mesh box, define the number of elements in each direction and the material point. Then we also created geometry primitives, in our case a, a Cartesian box, but we could also create a circle or a square to apply later on refinements on it. And we created different refinements for the surfaces, edges, regions and layers. Um, let's see, what is the progress of our split? <laughs> Not so good, so let's continue with our wrap-up. Uh, there are some advanced topics uh, we didn't talk about it since our time is restricted, but you should take a look at it if you really do want to make more advanced simulation later on. First and most important point is cat cleaning and preparation, which was done here already, but this means that you have to simplify your model for make it suitable for CFD simulation. And then also one thing is mesh quality assignments, since the quality of the mesh can have a big impact on the results of your simulation. And there is some, oh, so first of all, our cut was loaded, so take a look, let's take a look at the cut. This, this cut was made in the near of the end plate. Now let's move this clip a little bit. Okay, and let's continue with our wrap-up. Sorry, guys. Um, yes, and match quality can, for example, be checked here. So you get an error message when there is a problem with your cat model or your mesh quality. Right, and now it's time, I think, for um, talking about simulation setup since the mesh was created. And for this, first of all, you should understand that model, uh, you in the end are just telling how your model is interacting with its environment. And if we take a look at our model here, I mean, the idea of CFD in the end, or one of the important, most important thing is that you should consider everything you know about your result to simplify the, the, the computational effort. And in our case, let's think, what do we know about our actual solution? We know all the, all the values for velocity at the inlet because it's in our inlet velocity. This is something we define. What we don't know is the pressure here. On the outlet phase, we don't know the velocity distribution. But what we know is the pressure for every point here because the pressure at this line will be our, uh, 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 our standard pressure, our environment pressure. We know the velocity also for every point on the floor because the floor will move with the same velocity. Because you should not forget, in reality, the car is moving through the air, not the air around the car. And therefore, there is no relative velocity between airstream and floor. And what we don't know is the pressure distribution here. And we know, for example, that this upper wall, it has a kind of slip condition. That means this wall is not interacting in reality with our result. And what we know is that the velocity on the body itself is zero, it's a, our non-slip condition, and we don't know the pressure distribution. And this information later on, we are transforming them into boundary conditions, and then are used later on to calculate the result of our simulation. Um, okay, then, let's go to simulation setup. By the way, the mesh clip was finished right now. Great, and now we can Take a look, and here was a question by Vladimir, how we can change the rotation points of your measure. You can change it by just double-click with your left mouse button. Okay, and if we now 
take here a closer look, we can see the layer elements and the refinement around the wing. Okay, now let's start with the simulation setup. We'll create a new simulation. And again, the type is incompressible fluid dynamic. We're expecting highly turbulent flow, so we will use the turbulence model, and we're interested in the steady state result. Save. And the uh, simulation project tree is built automatically. Now we have to specify the mesh you want to use. We will use for sure the only mesh we have, which we created just before. And then, next thing following this path is we have to specify the material of our domain, so which kind of gas or fluid should flow. And we will access our library. We want to use air and apply it on the whole region. The next thing, which is also very important, or is, is talking about initial conditions. As you know, as I mentioned, these equations for the simulation are solved uh, numerically with iter iterations. And so we need a kind of starting value, which should be as, as, as uh, uh, accurate as possible. So it should be, uh, in the best case, our initial solution we start with is very uh, equivalent to the to the simulation result we're looking for. But since we don't know a lot, we will not change pressure and velocity initial values. The only thing we have to adapt is the values for k and omega, uh, since they're important for the turbulence model. As you know, our this turbulence structure are not simulated directly. We're using submodels for that. And these values will be again provided. You can calculate them also yourself. There are some good instructions in the internet how to do it. And it's just depending basically on the length of your wing the, and your, the proper uh, properties of your fluid. And then we can start to define the boundary conditions. Let's take again a look at our slide and start with this phase here. What we know is the velocity, what we don't know is pressure. So we will add a boundary condition, type velocity inlet, let's call it inlet, and here velocity is a fixed value of let's say 80 meters per second, and we don't have to specify any pressure since we don't know the pressure. And add selection. The same thing for the outlet. Select the phase, call it outlet, type in this case pressure outlet, where we I have to specify a pressure, we will use zero because we're talking here about relative pressures, and we don't have to specify a velocity since we don't know it and we want to, it to be calculated. Next thing is for sure our symmetry plane. Type symmetry. And we're done. And you can assume this non-slip wall, some slip walls are missing. Because in reality, these walls would not exist, <coughs> you know, and therefore we cannot handle them like physical walls or should not handle them like physical walls. Type wall, but slip wall. And what is missing is the floor and the wing itself. So we will create here a boundary condition for the floor. Type wall. And here we have moving wall velocity, same direction like the velocity inlet. And finally, we are missing the wing itself. And basically, we don't have to define even the boundary condition for the wing, because automatically everything which is not defined will be treated as a physical wall, as a slip wall, as a non-slip wall. But just to show you how it would work, you mark all the other surfaces which you have selected already, invert your selection, and you should not do it before you've added new boundary condition, because otherwise you will use your selection. So again, select everything, input selection, type wall. And now, as you can see, only the bounding box walls are not selected. Okay, now we let's tune a little bit our numerics, like last time. So the settings are recommended for external aerodynamics. We will use different solvers for the physical quantities. And for the divergence schemes, we will use bounded gas upwind approach. This is not mandatory, but I would recommend it, because it will make a simulation faster and more robust. Great, click on Save. Now we have to define the number of iteration, one to one, let's say 1,000. We are only interested in the final result, and we want to use 16 processors for um, our simulation. And we would like to measure 
the lift and drag force of the wing during the simulation. So the same game and now we'll just have to invert it and done. If you want you can even calculate this forces for single paths. For this let's just for example hide everything, create a new force a moment item. And let's say you just Let's say, sorry, let's say you're just interested in the front wing, we will just select the shape of the uh, front wing, of the, of the first element. Call it main plane and then we can calculate how much of this downforce is calculated only by the main plane. Okay, then check the simulation, create a new run, and then you can basically start it. Um, okay, guys, then, um, because the simulation could take up to one hour, let's first of all do a wrap up and then take a look at the simulation results I've prepared. Okay, so first of all, we talked about the general simulation results, a uh, setup. So, select the right type of simulation fluid dynamics and that we want to run an incompressible simulation for turbulence flow and a steady state result. I mean, this is something, when, when it comes to simulation, it's very important that you understand what you want to simulate. And if you just roughly know what kind of physical effects are occurring, this our uh, project tree will guide you to the right uh, simulation uh, setup, general mesh setup. Then we defined a material and assigned it to a mesh. We talked about boundary condition assignment, numerics, and how to start the simulation. And the for sure advanced topic, for example, in real F1, uh, they are also doing transient simulation results where they're looking at the uh, uh, time depending effects of the flow, and for sure. Uh, a numerical solver setting and one solver control can be used to improve the quality of the simulation. Great, then let's now switch to our simulation which is finished. We have here exactly the same settings. First of all, when your simulation is finished, you, g you get uh, notified, notified, notified by email. And then, here first of all, you can see this residual, so the, the, the average error for different quantities for every iteration, which be and the error becomes smaller and smaller, which is good. Now let's switch to Postgres. So first of all, take a look at our result control item. And this is uh, uh, the forces for the whole wing, and here we can see Let's first of all put off all momentums. We can also put off Poros Force, which is not existing in our case. Okay, first of all, everything is stable and converged. That means our simulation is good. And then we can see the pressure force in Y direction is quite big, but this is not important because it's a symmetrical body. So in reality, there is no force. We have a pressure force of in x direction of 360 Newton and we have a pressure force in that direction of 1500 Newton. And first of all we can see the uh, the pressure the pressure in this drag is much bigger than the viscous drag because of, of fraction and we can use this numbers law to fill out our table later on. And we can also take a look into the three-dimensional results. For this, click on solution fields. And since a lot of people asked, and basically it's quite easy, 
but our post processor is still a beta version as you can see so sometimes it's slow or crashing we recommend local post processing at uh, right now with Paraview, which you can download for free here and we'll first of all do a short demonstration for 3d post processing uh, on the platform online and then i also prepared an example locally which we can uh, discuss okay right now he's adding first of all all your data which can be quite big this is like i think two or three million cells and then it's added to the 3d viewer first of all let's jump to the latest simulation iteration and some people ask me why it's not a thousand but 800 and uh, like 870 iterations the reason is that automatically when a kind of accuracy is reached we are stopping the simulation job now we are at the latest time step and we can change representation to pressure for example that so not take some seconds maybe Okay, guys, and now it's loaded. Let's now <laughs> dive into it, and here we can see the pressure distribution. And as, Ak as Akram described, we have this high pressure region on the top, low pressure on the underside. We can also take a look at a slice, for example, through this domain. But the calculation can take some seconds, sorry guys. And now what's here? Let's change the center of rotation. So here we can see a cut through the wing and for example we can take a look at the velocity distribution here and the according pressure distribution and we can even create streamlines um, here is an option called stream tracer First of all, change the point source. Sorry, guys. And now, for example, we can just change. And then we get our new streamlines calculated here. And we can now turn, for example, also the wing on again. And then we can see the streamlines. And everything you do, you can save it here and even create screenshots using this button. Okay, then let's do a quick up, wrap up. Wrap up. Um, we talked about general post processing online using slices and streamlines and how to create screenshots. You can even compare results if you want to just by splitting the view 
and then you can add it again to the viewer. Yes, and once topics would be everything which located to local post processing, and this is what we will do right now. So for this, I've prepared this local version. So it's the same simulation. You can download your simulation result uh, on the simulation designer tab here on the results. And when you open them then with Paraview, I've imported them and extracted first of all the wing surface itself here. And I would like uh, now to, to Akram to join us again since I think he can um, tell us some things about the simulation. Let me just see. Uh, here. Akram, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Hi, back again. Great. Okay, here we have the simulation from this week's session. It's eight at 80 meters mm -hmm. per second. And first of all, I would say let's put on the pressure coefficient, and maybe let's try. I try to give you control over my mouse. All right. Now you should be able to. Yeah, it's okay. Cool. Maybe if... uh, I think it's a little bit uh, tricky to control it because it's a little bit slow here for me. Okay, then maybe I will take back control. Yeah. And then we'll do it together. So first of all, what we can see is uh, here really is a, a pressure distribution. And I think the most important thing about the pressure distribution is uh, that uh, we are using a special representation here called the pressure coefficient. And in the end, what we're doing here, we are dividing the, the actual pressure by by a factor calculated from density and and velocity of 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 the of the speed of the of the wing, and uh, then it makes it easier to compare different designs. And I mean, first of all, what we can see here, for example, and which is a very easy and local version of Paraview, is if we create this slice, for example, here. Sorry, this one. We can, for example, easily visualize the what Akram was talking about. Here you see two of them, both created by the rear wing. And I think here, Akram, right, we should consider that the single rear wing is acting different or behaving different than a rear wing on a full car. Mm -hmm, yeah. But I think uh, what becomes obvious is don't be confused by these two colors. They're representing now different things. But what we can really see here is that this blue and red one are two corresponding bit vertices. And I would swear that they are created by the end plate, right? Yeah, that's right. So we can see here also the streamlines and how the air is redirected by the wing. And if you want to investigate your simulations yourself, we recommend to do local post processing. And if there are more questions, I think we can provide you with a kind of video tutorial uh, which is dedicated to, to, to this rear wing example. OK, guys, then I would say uh, this was our demonstration. And right now, we can talk about the homework assignments, about your question. So as Akram told you, uh, there are some special devices which are installed, integrated on the rear wing, and one of them are the slots, which are called Louvres on F1. And your job is to, is to investigate how they are working exactly. For this, we'll provide you with two, uh, a project containing two rear wing models, one and one without the slots. And you should then do for each of the designs a, a fluid flow simulation at three different velocities and compare the results. And not only the drag and the downforce, but also, if you're possible, to do some quanti qualitative research using post-processing. And just to give you a first introduction or first hint here, I've prepared a slice through, which is cutting through of uh, this Louvres. If you now take a look here at um, the velocity and the component again in y direction, you see that it's nearly uh, 0 
it's it's really quite high. It's like minus 50 meters per second in y direction. And so the slots, one effect of them is that they are removing air from this upper side of the wing and this can reduce the drag. But I think the rest you should investigate yourself. If you have questions, we will upload uh, in the next days uh, the recording as well as step-by-step -step instructions for the homework and exercise description. So please stay patient and remember you have still some days left for the previous homework. Okay, and then now it's time for your questions. Um, I have a lot of them here, so I would just uh, read them and maybe some of them are related more to Akram, then Akram should uh, uh, answer them. First of all, a question by Mott. He asked if he can have a dedicated tutorial about about post-processing, I think you got into introduction instruction now, and would also try to provide you with a dedicated post-processing tutorial for F1. Next question is related to Akram. It's by Kevin, and Kevin wants to know, or Kevin asks uh, Akram, can you talk about the effect of using serrated edges of on the wings? Also, what kind of effect will the rotating tires have on aerodynamics versus the static model? And can can sim scale simulate this? Can SimScale simulate the effects of the intake of the car and the flow within given an appropriate CAD model? And how much would this change aerodynamic effects versus simplified solid model? I think that's a very long question. Um, Akram, you should also be able to see this question. So it should be a... Yeah, a, yeah, I do. Maybe I can just answer the one part of the question regarding if SimScale can simulate it or not. Yes, on SimScale you can simulate rotating wheels and parts without any problems, and you can also model intakes, uh, etc. So this is not a problem from, from this side. And there's some, some part of the question still missing. Akra, maybe you can help me out here. Yeah, for sure. So for the, the age, uh, can you uh, call, tell me yes. again what's the age, how is called it? Uh, I forget the name. Serrated. Yeah, the serrated age, the idea is to create a vortices. And the idea from creating vortices, as I have already explained, is uh, because this vortex is, it will be small uh, core vortex. And the idea will be to take a quantity from the air, from the, the free stream air with high kinetic energy and take some particles because you will create a swirl movement in the air. So you will take some quantities from a uh, quantity from this uh, high kinetic energy energy flow and take it to the boundary layer so we will create turbulent can boundary layer and we know that the kinetic uh, sorry the turbulent uh, boundary layer have more kinetic energy and this will help the the flow still attached more uh, along the your your uh, surface okay All right. great thank you very much um, then I think another part was about the rotating tires, which effect they have. Yeah, of course. The, the the difference between the rotating tire and the static tire, especially in the point of rotation of the detachment of the flow, because if it's static uh, tire, the flow will still attach it at some angle. So if we try just to uh, take the angle maybe from the front, so the zero from really the leading edge, or, uh, I mean the, the front of the tire, so maybe at uh, 90, maybe 120, maybe 130, uh, maybe at 130, the flow will degrees, I mean the flow still attached, but with the rotating tire, the flow will detach on top, so, we, uh, so maybe at 80 uh, degrees, the flow will uh, detach because due to the rotations, so the flow cannot stay attached to the surface, and also, if we if we plot the pressure distribution on the the rotating tire, is completely different. So, uh, of course, about this question, I will mark it here and I will uh, like uh, put some materials on the the blog later to explain this point more because it's more interesting if we see some plots of pressure distribution along the tire to like to show the difference between a stationary one and rotating tire. Okay, great, Akram. Do you, then let's maybe get prepared for the next session. Mm -hmm. Or do you have it on uh, available right now? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, this evening, or I can put it on the forum, the blog. 
Yeah, the forum. Yeah, that sounds. By the way, guys, if you have questions, you can ask your questions, even if they're F1 related. Whatever you want, you can post them to the forum, and we will answer them. Okay, then the next question is by Thomas, and uh, he asks, could you discuss briefly rounded attack edges of air foils and air inlets on the car versus if they were sharp wedges? Edges. Uh, sorry. He wants to, if you can discuss briefly rounded attack edges of air faults and air inlets on the car versus if they were sharp wedge edges. Sorry, I have to find the question here. Uh, can you can you give me what on which on four four twenty by Thomas? Okay. I think the question is talking more about the leading edge, that's right. Thomas, can you maybe just... Yeah, I think the question is not really clear. Maybe if he can... T uh, Give the question again because uh, here the idea. Okay, then we will put this question back and maybe uh, Thomas can precise this, this question. Next, his next question is: uh, Last week we have seen the rear wing being different for slow and fast race tracks. How much of all the other elaborate airflow control features change between the slow and the fast track? Yeah, it's it's dependent on so in the design. So, there, for example, if we talk about the front wing, uh, for example, the front wing. If we take front wing for the high uh, downforce, you will see a lot of extra elements, especially in the region of the the cascade elements and also the flaps, especially the two last flaps, because generally they are really large and with. Um, like re really highly l loaded on the region of the Y250 and also we can see like I said more extra elements but for example if we take for a lo uh, low downforce we will sometimes we will ban completely the, uh, the, the cascade elements so we will use only the main wing and uh, the flaps and also maybe if we talk about uh, Generally, for a difference between high downforce and low downforce circuits in terms of like the, uh, uh, the visual uh, the visual design, so let's say the rear wing and the front wing are the most affected parts. So uh, as we have seen the last time, the rear wing is really com com is complicated, completely different uh, in terms of camber and the size of the rear wing, but also for the front wing can be like some elements completely banned from the design and the size of some elements is completely different. But these are the two most remarkable parts in, uh, between race and another. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. There is a, qu uh, a question by Kevin. Uh, Akram, he asked you if you could please talk about the S-duct and the trade-off that happens between improving boundary layer on the nose by removing high energy air from underbody. Yeah, that's right. The the S duct the S the S duct generally uh, was introduced in the few last years, uh, especially in the in the point between the nose and the chassis of the car. And the idea is to to like reduce some to reduce uh, this the growth of the boundary layer from the lower the lower side of the nose and take it using this uh, duct and take it the, to the up of the the chassis of the car and this have an effect on the like because if this boundary will grow and will at some point detach will create like pressure from the lower side of the nose and this will create like more pressure from the lower side in fact in consequence you will have more left so for this reason they use this to reduce the pressure from the lower side of the nose okay great thank you there's the next question by Kevin and um, maybe you can talk about uh, the one thing uh, that F1 drivers complaining that current aerodynamic design makes it very difficult to follow other cars closely due to the dirty air compared to older cars. 
and this is part of the reason why DAS was implemented to aid overtaking. And Akram, can you explain why currently Zayn makes it hard to follow cars, what dirty errors, and what was the difference about all the cars that made them better for following other cars? So the idea behind follow, following another car is, that's right, it's dirty air, but in the same time, this air is like uh, with low velocity compared to the free stream. So if you are following a car, um, so if you are the driver behind the, the car in the front, you will benefit from, like, you, you will have less pressure applied on your car, so more less resistance. So this will give you more, like, uh, more, uh, power or you, you will have less drag than the front the car in front and this will give you more uh, possibilities to uh, overtake it but the problem is uh, this this uh, concept can be a little bit not the right decision in the curves in, in the street lines it's okay to to be in behind the car to reduce the the drag created by your car but in the curves it's not really right because you have side wind but also if you are like behind the car you will reduce you will lose some downforce and this can uh, reduce your performance in the curves okay Akram thank you very much oh guys we have so much more questions I don't know if we have enough time to, to cover them all but I will try our best um, okay uh, Marty uh, ask if it's possible to see vortices in runs or with run simulation yes it is as i showed yeah. you with this example here not sorry not this one but maybe in this question it's it's um like you have said the last time uh milad there is there is a difference between vortex and turbulence they, maybe the question is in this way because a vortex you can see the vortex with runs for sure and if you have seen my presentation some uh, some pictures was about vortices so visualizing vortices and all these uh, simulations was done using runs yes and and maybe just because he also asked what does it, uh the difference between k omega and caps on turbulence models maybe first of all what akram said is very important even the flow over a plate can be turbulent. It's not related. Uh, a, a vortex, I think, is, is turbulent every time. <laughs> I never heard about a laminar vortex, but basically a vortex is just that your flow is rotating around the axis. So this is very important what Akram say. You have to differentiate between vortex and laminar or turbulent. And regarding Marty's question, the big difference between K-omega and K-epsilon model is um, how the turbulence quantities are used to calculate this turbulence uh, properties. And we are using K-omega SST, which is a hybrid turbulence model, which is performing uh, on the outside of the, of the flow domain, on the uh, boundaries of the flow domain, like a K-epsilon model and like a, a SST model in the near of walls. And I would suggest to use K-omega SST all the time, but if you really want to get very accurate results about turbulence or about vortexes, uh, maybe DES would be the best solution. But for F1, even for Formula 1, K-omega is fine. Anything to add, Akram? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's perfect. I think that's all what you can uh, like understand from the difference of between k omega and uh, k epsilon it's just in the way of how the the turbulence is modeled so in the quantities so one you will use uh, dissipation rate and the other one is specific dissipation rate that's all so we will not go through that like the details but uh, of course if you are interested we can we can also put some materials concerning turbulence modeling in the, the forum later Yes, absolutely. And by the way, if you qualify for this pre-professional training, you will get a very f a good introduction to turbulence modeling in general. Okay, next question is um, again by Thomas, and he wants to know which uh, flow parameters were used for the ISO surfaces and at what magnitude. I think he is talking about these images. I think. Right? Yeah, no. that's right. No, this is not. Now, the, uh, the next slide. This one here. 
yeah. So in this in this uh, quant quantities there is three major uh, like quantities to visualize these vortices. So maybe the Q criterion, also the the lambda two, and you can also use the vorticity. These three uh, uh, parameters can be used to visualize your isosurface. And concerning your uh, concerning your value is dependent on on your simulations, so maybe some simulations you will find approximately like 5,000, maybe less, maybe more. It's dependent on your parameter and also your operation conditions and also your what what you are looking for. So if you have like a small winglet or a small uh, vortex generator, or if you have like rear wing where you have strong vortex, so it, it's dependent on so the value it's dependent on your uh, design, but Concerning the, the the parameters are generally a Q criterion, lambda two, and uh, vorticity, and approximately in all the past processing tools you can find these uh, parameters. Okay, thank you very much, Akram. Next question is um, Pamati. He just wants to know uh, since the vortex is a low pressure core, why wouldn't you want to vortices going into the diffuser from the side? Maybe you can uh, answer this question, Akram. Yeah. So the idea, so the idea of the vortex, it's like low energy, low low pressure core, but in the same time, it's really high kinetic energy flow core. And the idea of how in this vortex between the rear tire and the diffuser is, I will explain this in more detail. So if we if we look to the to the flow just in the contact between the tire and the floor. Uh, yeah, the floor or the, the the ground. So in this point, the flow is really turbulent, and I I, I think this is really important. Also, I can uh, put some pictures later to illustrate this. So the flow is really turbulent, and this flow turbulent flow is with the low energy uh, kinetic energy uh, specification. So we don't need this flow to go to go to the diffuser because if this flow we go to the diffuser will create problem for the flow coming from the floor and will completely make the uh, the diffuser inefficient and you will lose a lot of downforce. So for this reason what they use with the new regulation, because with the old regulation, what they did, they just inject this uh, uh, exhaust air coming from the pipe between the tire and the floor. And the idea is to sell or to close your floor from the sides to make that this uh, turbulent flow will not escape to the floor. So the idea from having these forces between the rear tire and the diffuser is to sell and to close your floor your diffuser from the sides to make sure that only the clean air coming from the floor is going to the diffuser that that this is the reason behind using uh, vortices between the tire and the diffuser thank you very much guys you Ask, since asking so many questions, I'm very afraid we can't answer them all. And since we are 40 minutes uh, over the time, I will just pick some last questions. And the other question, please post them to the forum. We'll answer them there. So um, one question is by Abdul. He wants to know if you can run as many simulations as you want in parallel. And that's possible. You can run four or five simulations at the same time. That's a good thing about the cloud. Then Krishna wants to know uh, how we, it's possible to use SimScale data in third-party products. And yes, we are supporting import for meshes from third-party tools. And a lot of third-party tools like Paraview can open and proceed our simulation results. OK, then Chien wants to know that uh, or ask if it's possible to reduce the file size of the homework, because this one was about 6 gigabyte, first of all. Uh, the files, files are compressed when you're going to download them so that we reduce the file size. And if it's still so big, you should take a look if you maybe made a, 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 a mistake when defining this, this uh, points where you want to save your simulation results. As you know, you are defining here the write interval. And if it's, for example, 100 instead of 1000, you will have 10 simulation steps and a, ten, a, a, a result file which is 10 times the size. Okay, and then let's see. Um, 
Juan wants to know if you have to submit the force table for the homework. No, for all homework we just need the simulation project, but we would love if you start to discuss about your results in the forum. Okay guys, thank you very much for your time. If you have another question, please write it to the forum. Thank you very much for being here. You will receive the homework for next for this session in the next days. Hope to see you next week. Have a nice evening. Bye.